Hi, my name's Jo and this is Ollie and together we make up two thirds of the CBSO's clarinet section. We decided to get together today to talk about Ruth Gipps. So some of you might know already that Ollie's grandfather, John Fust, used to have the chair of um, section leader clarinet in the CBSO. And so it's really an amazing connection that Ollie's managed to get that position too. What some of you might not know is that John was also my teacher because I grew up in the Wirral and by the time I was having lessons with him, he had taken up the principal clarinet seat in the Liverpool Phil. So all in, it's quite a nice story that we've got all linked to John. But we actually were thinking about how far we could trace back a real life kind of connection to Ruth. And so it got us thinking about Ollie's granddad. Um, so Ollie's granddad was appointed to the orchestra in, when Ollie, was it 1955? Yeah, in, in the 50s, yeah. Um, uh -huh. And he was appointed by Robert Baker, the then first clarinet. That's who right. Then, who, and he was Ruth Gipps's husband. That's right, yeah. So um, my granddad joined as second clarinet um, to Robert Baker. Um, and then Robert Baker left in, in the 50s, early to mid 50s, and my granddad moved up to principal clarinet then. Wow, that's amazing. So he must have known Ruth and Robert quite well, I guess. Yeah, very well. Um, in fact, Robert was my, uh, is my uh, uncle's godfather. Um, they, I think they became um, relatively good friends in the short time that they crossed over uh, in the CBSO. Uh, in fact, interestingly, Robert Baker also joined as second clarinet and then moved up to first clarinet as well. It seemed to be oh the, my, thing, the thing oh to do goodness. in those days. <laughs> I promise you, you're safe with me. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but just for those who might not know, so Ollie's uncle is David Fust, who is also a um, professional clarinet player in London. So um, it's a very musical family and very dominated by the clarinet. <laughs> there was no escaping. I tried my best. <laughs> Wow, so Robert Baker was, is, was David's godfather. Yeah. So tell us about their relationship. Well, I think they used to um, go and go and see, visit them semi-regularly. I think they had a house in Sussex, I think. Uh, Ruth and Robert, that is. Um, and yeah, I, I think Robert passed away at a relatively young age, um, not, you know, not a million years after leaving the CBSO. But um, definitely remember him, and uh, I think my mum as well. Remember particularly Ruth because she was such a character. Um, uh, apparently, she was infamous. <laughs> so I've only done some reading about her, but she sounds like she was quite a tour de force, a really strong woman with really clear ambitions and really determined, and kind of didn't let anything phase her. In many ways, one would sort of just describe her as a very modern type of woman but perhaps um, stuck in a time when things just weren't quite so easy for a woman who had those characteristics or that drive or ambition. And so much of what I've read is that, um, you know, she was really supported to a certain point, but only as appropriate as it was for a woman to do those things. And I even read um, about when she started to conduct that actually for a woman to empower other people to play together, is a very positive thing, but that a woman should never have had the authority to be um, the driving voice of an orchestra. It's absolutely incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, but she, she, she did, um, she sort of broke all boundaries, didn't she? She was prolific com composer, oboist, and conductor. She did all, like, the whole, the whole family of musical things. I think she studied with Vaughan Williams, did she, a, a composition? Um, and Gordon Jacob as well, I think. Gordon Jacob, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's incredible. Um, and did you did you hear that story that she'd played a piano concerto? Was it Glazunov piano concerto in a concert, and then in the second half went to play the cor anglais solo in one of her own pieces? It's like, oh, and gee, like, <laughs> I mean, that's a whole different level of talent, isn't it? You know, we talk about doubling in special instrument fees. It's like that's a whole different stratosphere, isn't it? Yeah, they don't make them like that anymore. <laughs> so I think um, what I really been excited to see is just how much she wrote for the clarinet actually um I guess she had quite a good understanding of it given that her husband is a clarinet player 
Um, and there aren't many composers for us that we can go, right, they wrote um, a sonata, a concerto, a quintet, some chamber music, you know, probably we would talk about Brahms or Weber, but actually Ruth Gipps has written all of that for the clarinet too, hasn't she? Yeah, she, I mean, like, like you say, living with uh, a clarinetist, she, she knew the instrument well, um, but she wrote um, a Rhapsody quintet for clarinet and string quintet, um, a sonata, a bass clarinet prelude and a, a quintet for clarinet, oboe and strings as well. So she she kind of used the instrument in lots of different ways. But I, I think some of the stuff is is sort of being more discovered nowadays. It's sort of coming back into the into the lineup, which is great because it's really good, really good music. Uh, yeah. So I, I've got a couple of the sort of handwritten parts that she wrote um, for the, the Rhapsody clarinet quintet um, wow so is so that the original original score it's original it's got all it's got all handwritten markings I, I wonder whether she worked on it um uh, well obviously with Robert but possibly with my granddad as well whether he got around to playing it I don't know but it's this is I mean some of the sonata it's oh wow all sort of I mean quite hard to read but it's, it's um and so have you played the sonata yet no, I'm not actually. I've been I've been trying to learn it the last couple of weeks. Fantastic. It's lovely. <laughs> so, like you say, she she's a composer. She's an oboist. She's a concert pianist. She got given the opportunity, I think, didn't she, by George Weldon to she was asked to run the city choir um, for some time. I think from about 1947 or something. And then I also found out by reading um, Richard Bratby's book that she was the editor for the CBSO magazine at the time, which I guess is a little bit like our music stand magazine that we have now, and it was called Play On, which then made me have a little thought because the last time that I saw Ollie's granddad, John Fust, um, was probably about a year before he passed away. And I, it was because the orchestra were playing up in Manchester. And so, um, it felt very important to me all of a sudden to take up Martin Davis um, John's old second clarinet and my um, predecessor up to Manchester to see him. And so we went to his house and um, Ollie's mum, Janet, made us a nice cake and cups of tea. And it was a really, really delightful afternoon. They both came to Bridgewater Hall and listened to listened to the rehearsal. It was it was really amazing. But John gave me a couple of things. And so I went searching for these couple of things and look what I found. So wow. this, is, this is an original copy of the CBSO magazine Play On edited by Ruth Gipps from December, November, December 1949. And apparently this was the last edition um, that they were able to complete because I think it cost too much money but it's absolutely lovely. And what's really interesting to read is that so many of the problems that um, we seem to have in, in the current here and now about, you know, connecting with different audiences and repertoire and how to excite other people about what and how we do things. It's just the same, same challenges that they had then. Um, I must just show you one particular highlight though, if I may. It's when they did a sort of player profile. So they've got four players. I don't know if you can see that there. And it was this player that interested me most. So this was Albert Russell, also known as Russ. He was sub-principal second violin. And he's just done his biography in note form. Um, can I read you a couple of lines of it? So yeah. Funny. Yeah, so he said, um, Born Tamworth, Staffordshire, originally intended for priesthood, expelled from choir for fighting, decided to become professional boxer, joined local boxing club, where endured two bashings a week for about 12 months, began to study with a view to becoming a draftsman and sold pot boiler watercolors, spent most of the proceeds in the local, was a great trial to parents. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and all of the others are very serious and tell you where they came from, how long that they've been playing and um, yeah, who they started yeah. with. You know, it's just so funny, isn't it? And how you get that real sense of character. That's so brilliant. A little bit more back to, to Ruth then and your family connections. So tell us about David. 
yeah, David, David obviously uh, grew up knowing um, Robert and Ruth, slight, um, you know, as, as God, Godfather. And uh, as David's career went on, he ended up performing as a soloist with Ruth conducting. Um, oh. And, uh, you know, they, they seem to go, they seem to sort of cross paths quite, quite frequently, I think. So Ruth did, um, once she'd finished in Birmingham and she went back to London, she did some really exceptional things, didn't she? She started two of her own orchestras, one of which was a little bit like the current day South Bank Symphonia, like an opportunity for younger people to experience life in the profession. I think that was called like the One Rehearsal Orchestra or something, wasn't That's it? That's right, yeah. And so it was just an opportunity for people to learn repertoire, play it together, and learn to sight read, which has always been such an important part of, of orchestral life in the UK. And um, I think people were really, she's, it's really well documented that she had just an incredible generosity in her spirit um, about sharing that love of music and that ability to make music with other people. And I read also that perhaps that slightly colder aspect of her character um, in her personality just felt like a very strange um, contradiction to this warmth and expression and depth of feeling in her music. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought it might be really nice to be able to share with you a piece of Ruth Gipps music. So to celebrate her birth a hundred years ago today, we'd like to offer you the third member of our clarinet section, Mark O'Brien, who would like to play for you Ruth Gipps Prelude for solo bass clarinet. In talking to Mark about this piece, it's quite interesting because there aren't so many pieces available for solo bass clarinet, and the ones that are, are perhaps not always overly melodic, beautiful, singing, kind of melodies. Some of them tend to be a little bit more contemporary with some more contemporary techniques. This piece is really beautiful. It's really persuasive. It uses the full range of the instrument and I think not only makes the case for um, solo bass clarinet music but absolutely for the music of Ruth Gipps. I very much hope that we'll be able to share some more of her music with you, perhaps even as soon as International Women's Day on the 8th of March. Thanks so much for chatting, Ollie. Thanks, Joe. See you soon. Bye.